What is going on, everybody? Happy new comic book day. Happy Wednesday. Happy Whiplash Wednesday. This is Brandon, Comics Kings. Welcome back to the kingdom, you guys. If you're new, make sure you guys subscribe to the channel. It goes a long way. Another way you can help us out today is by hitting the like button. If you like what you're seeing because it's hard putting these shows together, it's great and it's a lot of fun. And I'm really excited to give you guys this opportunity uh, whenever this show happens. This is Creator's Corner, one of my favorite shows where we talk to a creator in the industry, get to know their story, talk about a specific subject. We got a lot of people in the chat today. If you have a question, leave it in the chat and I'll get to it. We'll leave it into the show organically. Today, let's welcome comic book legend, one of my favorite people. Met him at Baltimore a few weeks ago. Uh, that, that's my dog in the background, if you hear him. Jim Shooter, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. How are you, Brandon? I'm great, man. I am great. It's always Wednesdays are probably my favorite day of the week because it's like saying, hey, Friday's right around the corner. You're off work on the weekend, but you get to new comic book day. You are. <laughs> I'm off on the weekends, uh, most of them, but I'm really excited to be here, man. A uh, question for you. What got you uh, into comic books? Well, when I was a little kid, I read comics, uh, and that was in the 50s. Uh, mostly what I read was, you know, Disney Ducks and, you know, the, the really the only superheroes were Superman and Batman. And uh, I missed some miscellaneous, you know. I mean, when I was a little right. kid, you know, you know, baby Huey was big. I don't know. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I read for until I was about eight years old and I just kind of got bored with them. And uh, cause they were all the same. I mean, every issue it's, you know, the penguin fighting the Batman on the top of giant toothpaste tubes or typewriters or something. And every issue it's Lois Lane trying to find out Superman's secret identity. And it just got tedious. I thought these are the same stories again and again. And uh, so I gave them up for a while. I rediscovered them four years later when I was 12. And there were these new fangled Marvel comics, and they were really good. And uh, that got me back into it. I started reading these 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 Marvel comics. And, and in fact, that's what inspired me to try to do it. I, I read these books and I said, these are great. I want to do this. Anyway. So who was the who was the first one that you probably like got off the spinner rack or went into the comic book store and saw that really grabbed your attention? Well, there weren't any comic book stores. Uh, the first ones off the spinner rack were, like I said, probably Duck Books and Superman, maybe. Um, the uh, uh, the first Marvels I came across, I was in the hospital for minor surgery. And in 1961, in, in, in a kid's ward in a the hospital, there's just tons of comic books. All right. Because uh, they were everywhere back then. It's not like today. And there were all these, you know, uh, DC comics, pristine, like no one had ever touched them. And then there were these ratty comic books, practically read to death. You know, there were these newfangled Marvels. And um, so first I read the DCs, and they were just pretty much like I left them. And then uh, I started reading the Marvels, and it just blew my mind. It was great. Right. So um, let's actually talk about how you started writing and how you got into Marvel because I was reading a little bit about it. You grew up in Pittsburgh. That's that's yep. my hometown as well. That's so important. you share that. Yeah, let's go let, let's go Steelers, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they won, you know. <laughs> I mean, hey, they made it hard, but they won. Yeah, uh, being a Steelers fan, it it's like a it, it's weird. It's like it, I don't even want to talk about that today, but it is the most stressful situation, and it's almost like a full time job on Sunday. <laughs> it's more stressful than me than going to it work is sometimes. Yeah. Um, but how did you really get your break in writing? Well, I mean, when I was 12 years old and I was reading these Marvel comics and they were so much better than the DCs and I, I wanted to do that. I wanted to, you know, draw or write. I, you know, I d didn't know then. And and so um, uh, uh, they um, uh, I, I decided when I was 12 years old, I'm going to learn how to do this. And so for a year, literally a year, I studied comics. I didn't just read them. I studied them. I took notes. I paid attention. I tried to figure out, you know, what the general idea was, how, how they went about this stuff. And when I was 13, I thought, I'm ready, you know, and I, I wrote a story. I didn't know how to, what a script looked like. So I just drew all the panels as best I could, just kind of crude layouts, made the balloons, you know, put in the copy. Um, I, I I designed a cover for it. I colored the cover so that they would 
know kind of what I had in mind there. And uh, I sent this little package off to uh, Mort Weisinger at DC Comics. And I got a letter back. And he said, oh, you know, these, this is nice. You, you know, you may have a future doing this. Um, why don't you send us another one? So I wrote a two-part story, two-issue story. It was kind of rare in those days. Uh, but I, I, I had this big story. And I thought, well, it'll take two issues. And we'll see what happens. Um, I didn't know if they'd like that. Um, but he, they did, he did like it. And he called me up. And uh, uh, I live 400 miles away in Pittsburgh. You know, he was in New yeah. York. He didn't have any idea how old I was. He called me up and he says, look, we're going to buy these three. We want to start using you as a regular writer. And from now on, I'll give you assignments. I said, great. He said, all right, your first assignment is Supergirl, 12 pages next Friday. I said, yes, sir. And so I started working and uh, work, I was in ninth grade, you know, and uh, and then uh, and Kes sent stuff in. He liked it. They, they bought it. I never had. I, I sold everything I ever wrote. Um, and, uh, and then finally one day he, uh, he went, we're talking, he says, well, I want you to fly up to New York, you know, put you up in a hotel for a week. We'll pay for everything. You know, uh, just want you to come to the office every day, learn some stuff. And I kind of hesitated cause I'm you know, just turned 14 and I'm wondering how that's going to go. Right. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so he, he, he said, how old are you? And I said, well, I just turned 14. He says, put your mother on the phone. <laughs> so my, my mother was on board. I mean, my family needed the money. She was happy to get those paychecks. So she's on board. And, and, and so he gets me back on the phone. He says, okay, I don't care how old you are. If you can do it, you can do it. And so uh, I had to take my mother with me on my first business trip, which is, you know, kind of uncool, but, you know, whatever. Pay the bills, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, and I just kept writing. I worked my way through high school. They kept me busy every minute I could give them. And, uh, um, you know, um, and then after that, I just kept doing it. Kept doing it. And then you eventually rose up being the editor in chief and being the basically the headmaster of, of the Bronze Age, which is, in my opinion, one of the most exciting moments in oh, comics, yeah. one of the most exciting ages in comics. How did you kind of find that that talent and create and well i, and, I was push all of these creators to what they are okay well i was i was uh freelancing doing some advertising work comics format advertising for places like us steel levi's jeans other places and uh and then freelancing for both dc and marvel a little and and then uh dc wanted to uh wanted me to you know be full time on on a couple of books, so I did that for a while, and then I uh, got a call from Marv Wolfman at Marvel. He said uh, something something like, "How would you like to work in editorial?" And I said, "I'd consider it," you know. And so he said, "Well, why don't you come up to New York? We'll talk." So I went to New York, and and basically, he, he in those days the books were every one was kind of his own editor. Uh, at Marvel, the writer would write a plot, send it straight to the artist. No one ever in the office ever saw it. The artist would draw it, send it back to the writer. He'd write the dialogue, send it right to the letter. The letter would send it to the anchor, and it would arrive in the office finished. And if there was a mistake, you had to like white things out, change the whole page, whatever. So, uh, so Marv had come up with this idea uh, that maybe somebody should check the books earlier on. Okay, right, revolutionary. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, he called the position pre proofer, like pre proofreader, proofreader. Right. I said, Mark, what you're asking me to do is edit the books. He's one, well, I want to call you editor. And I said, well, then, you know, I don't care about that. I don't care what you call me, pay me and I'll, that's fine. So we made a deal and I, I became the associate editor. I wasn't going to be a pre proofer. And, uh, so I became the associate editor. And in fact, I was the editor. And, um, you know, so I was there for a couple of years as editor, uh, did pretty good, um, wrote the Spider-Man strip with Stan. I'd write the story. I'd do my little layouts. Um, Stan would write the dialogue on my layouts. And then he'd give the whole thing to John at once. And John Romita would, would draw brilliant artwork. And um, 
you know, so I got to know Stan and, and, you know, learn stuff from him. And, uh, and then when Archie Goodwin w was leaving, uh, Stan recommended to the president to hire me. Stan didn't run the comics. He was all involved with the TV media stuff, you know, right. and, uh, uh, the, the, I, I the president of the company hired me and I reported to the president in essence I had Stan's old job okay I was I ran the comics and uh um so but Stan's office is 30 feet down the hall you think if I have a question I'm gonna go ask him of course I am right of course you know uh but but at any rate so I, I took <laughs> over as editor-in-chief it was a bad time for comics uh comics were dying all around us I mean Marvel was dying uh, right. We were losing money. But in that first year, uh, Warren went out of business. Charlton went out of business. Harvey stopped publishing. Archie went all reprint. And DC on one day canceled over 40% of their line. So we were the, like the healthiest you know, patient in the terminal ward. But we were still standing. And uh, But because everyone else was dying, all these creators are just wandering around on the street looking for jobs. So I was able to get Al Milgram, Laurie Hama, Denny O'Neill, Louise Simonson. That's like winning the lottery. <laughs> and, and, and Archie Goodwin, who had left to be a freelance writer, I convinced him to come back and take over the creator line. But I, what we were starting because we were starting a creator owned line, Epic, and um, which had been in the works before that. It was partially Stan's idea. And. And Archie's and mine. And uh, so he came back to take over that. And uh, Archie, Archie wasn't interested in the bureaucracy crap. You know, he didn't he didn't want to deal with the bean counters and the licensing people and the lawyers and stuff. And I said, I'll take care of that. I'm doing it anyway for the comics. Right. You know, I'll pave the road. You just do the book. And uh, and he did. And I left him alone. And he did brilliant stuff. I mean, what am I going to tell Archie? He knew everything. You know, he was way ahead of me. Right. But, um, uh, you know, so I, I that was able to get Archie. Holy cow. I mean, he's like the best ever. The best editor ever. And maybe the best writer. I mean, an amazing guy. Super creator. Right. Um, and, you know, and we got, like, I guess I mentioned Larry Hama. We got uh, Bob Budiansky. We got um, uh, Jim Salakrup. We had we, Chris we, Roger Stern for a while. Bob Hall for a while. We had the who's who, man. It was incredible. If you can't win with that team, fire the coach. Right. <laughs> anyway, so that's how that's how it came to be. And of course, all, a lot of creators were unemployed too. And there were people who didn't know me, or maybe had heard bad things about me, or something. I don't know. And we probably wouldn't have come knocking on Marvel's door if I was there. But Louise is there. If Louise is there, how bad can it be? If Archie's there, how bad can it be? If Al Milgram is there, it must be pretty cool. Right. So all these people started turning up and uh, and I did my part was getting them paid better, getting them benefits, getting which we did and um, royalties. And and I mean, it, it became a really good situation. Double the rates, doubled them again, kept raising them. Right. And um, every time we saved money or made money, I plowed it back in because uh, right. I had that uh, uh, freedom. Uh, the right. president said, do anything you want. Just don't lose money. Okay. Right. And uh, so that's pretty freehand. Uh, so we, you know, I'm, I'm trying to make situation better. And guess what? Word spreads. You can make money at Marvel. It's fair at Marvel. It's, it's good at Marvel. And so all these people show up looking up and down the, the, the room. And it's just like, holy cow. You know, now you, you had McLean and Claremont, um, uh, the, the Simonsons. You had, you had Bill Sienkiewicz. You had Paul Smith. You had the, the Sylvester for a while. We got, you know, it's like who's who. Anyway, if, right. you, if you if you got all those people and you got great editors, you know, and you know you're smart enough, and I'm I guess just barely smart enough, but you're smart enough to leave the people who know what they're doing alone and help the young guys, you win. One hundred percent. That's actually a lesson that I think modern comics today you need to get their hands uh, more involved in. Um, what was interesting to me is I was actually listening to a Rob Liefeld podcast and how he kind of described the Bronze Age. Kind of uh, when, when X-Men was and Daredevil were both um, bi-monthly. They ended up being monthly titles yeah, uh, when you became ed editor-in-chief. If you can kind of talk about, about that and how you granted creative freedom to Claremont, yeah. Byrne, Cockrum, 
to um, who, who I was doing uh, Fantastic Four at the time. If I, well, um, Perez was for a while, right. and after that, there oh, was George uh, Perez. Um, Perez, Perez, Perez. Accent on the first D. Perez. <laughs> My apologies, George. If no, you're watching. no, yeah, <laughs> no, George. You know, George wants it said right. It's Perez. Perez. Anyway, yes. So, so, uh, 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 yeah. Well, I mean, when I came in, we had some good guys. So we didn't have as many as we eventually did. We had some good guys. So we had this new guy, John Byrne, and I had fought to get him work there when Mar was still editor in chief. They didn't want to hire him. They didn't like his work. They they thought it was cartoony and everybody looked like they had they were rubber, had no bones, and all this stuff. I said, this guy can draw. You know, he he didn't know much about storytelling right off the bat. I kept trying to tell him when he really learned storytelling was when we were going to try him out on the Fantastic Four, and he he sat down and read every Kirby book that had, Fantastic Four had ever been done. And I think the little light bulb went on. I think that's what Shooter's been trying to tell me, you know. And <laughs> and and all of a sudden he became as good a storyteller as he is an artist. And then P.S. He had improved as an artist a lot. It's hard to yeah. believe. Like everybody thinks, well, John Byrne was always perfect. No, he wasn't. You know, the first Fantastic Four he drew was inked by Joe Sinnott, and Joe Sinnott redrew all the heads. Yeah. Okay, think about that. John wasn't pleased, but he, you know, what are you going to say to Joe? <laughs> Grandmaster Hall of Fame. You're not saying anything to him. So anyway, the thing is, we had good guys. Some of them grew and were talented. Some were already very accomplished, like Dave Cockrum, um, um, Perez, and uh, other people. And uh, I, I just tried to make it a good situation for them. And and this this new kid comes in looking for a job, Frank Miller. Okay, you know, looked at his stuff, gave him a tryout job, a little five page job just to try out. He butchered it. And, and I said, well, look, I'll pay you for this, but we can't, we can't use you. And he said, well, why not? And I said, you didn't do what I told you. You didn't listen to me. You know, I'm not going to you know, pay you just to go off and do crazy stuff. Well, then he say, he fesses up that Neil Adams had told him, you know, to do it a different way. I don't think Neil knew he was working for me. Neil and I are good buddies. You know, we've for 55 years, we've been good friends, but, um, uh, I, uh, you know, I guess Frank said, well, the editor said to do this way and that way. And, and they'll say, nah, do, you know, do it this way. So uh, anyway, so Frank says, give me another chance. And he was like real intense. Uh, so I figured maybe he was armed. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I gave him another chance. And then he he did what I asked him to do. And then he did, you know, kept doing stuff. And before you know, he's doing team up or something. And um all of a sudden he's catching on and he's, you know, all of a sudden now we're learning from him because he's inventing stuff. No one ever thought of before. And, uh, uh, just, you know, so we had him a genius. All right. So Daredevil, the, the people upstairs wanted to cancel it. The bean counters, the circulation guy, uh, yeah, every, only the president could overrule me. Okay. But they had the president's ear too. And they were working to try to get that book canceled. Cause it was, it was a dog. It was just not right. doing. I kept fighting. I said, "Nope, this Miller kid's a genius. It's going to take off." And uh, sure enough, it starts to turn around, and then it starts going up like a rocket. And pretty soon, it's our number two seller. Right. So I won the fight with Daredevil. X Men. I didn't have to fight. I mean, it was it was a bi monthly. It was mostly because that's the best Cockrum could do. Um, but it, when we could, we made it a monthly. Uh, it was a like high middle of the road book because it was good stuff. Um, and then when we did the death of Phoenix, that just, that went to number one in the industry and stayed there for 20 years. So I guess Claremont and the various artists, uh, were doing something right. Right. You know, that's, that's, um, really great to hear all these like different origin stories for how these books came to what they are. Cause nowadays like, we just see them as iconic runs, not really of, well, where, where do they start? Um, when yeah, Claremont... yeah. And nobody knows all the little right. uh, the paths that got us there. But uh, once we had the great creators and once people were, you know, like like John, you know, it took him a little while to catch on. Not long. And right. Frank, Frank, you know, caught on like crazy. I mean, every time you would tell him something, he'd make a quantum leap. He'd, he'd be that much better next time. And uh, I remember the day he came in, he says, I got it. 
Right. So I understand it, you know. And what he realizes, is you, you see, you see a story as a movie in your head. Okay, your job as a cartoonist is to make those people see the same movie. Okay. Right. He figured that out, and then he's Frank Miller. You know, look at him. Right. Uh, we do have a question from the chat. We have my man Magic Lasso Ryan. Uh, two parts. Uh, Dazzler seems to get a lot of grief in the community. Does she deserve that grief that she gets? And what would you have done differently with her character? Well, I mean, all right. The story of Dazzler was that um, our vice president of business affairs, uh, she went and made a deal with Casablanca Record and Filmworks, Neil Bogart's company, to do basically what Archie did with Archie's, the Archie's and Josie and the Pussycats. And in other words, create a musical character and then they would do records and, and right. we would do comics. They would use studio, studio musicians to do records and we would do comics and maybe get an animated series or whatever. So, okay. So I uh, got together some, some good people, uh, the John Romita Jr., me, uh, Tom DeFalco, uh, not sure who else, but anyway, we, we cooked up this character dazzler the period of time this happens in is the the disco era okay so sorry but you know <laughs> it actually started out being disco dazzler but we fixed that anyway uh um the casablanca thing uh uh it was it, we were on our way um they asked uh, us to write a, a half hour animated special to kick it off so i wrote the story myself why because they wanted it in like four days and archie i would have given it to archie because he's the best but uh there's no way he was doing it over a weekend so right. I, I i thought I, I can't you know i'll have to do it and so i thought i'll either be the hero or i'll be the goat so i did it the casablanca people liked it so much they said this isn't a half hour animated special this is a feature film i said wow oh cool and uh so am I that same vice president of business affairs, Alice Donenfeld, genius person, really just one of the best things that ever happened tomorrow. She went to um, the Cannes Film Festival and she met with this lady named Bo Derek right after the movie 10 had become a big hit, 10 starring Bo Derek. So Bo Derek was the hottest person in Hollywood. And uh, uh, so uh, she read my story. And she said, I got to play this character. I want to be the Dazzler. And wow. So for two weeks, we had all the studios in Hollywood bidding against each other, right, to do this movie. And we're thinking, hey, we won. We made it, you know. Uh, and then uh, she amended her attachment and said that she insisted on her husband directing it. And nobody was real fond of John Derrick's being a director. So everybody pulled out. That project fell apart shortly thereafter. Neil Bogart died, and just you know, okay, so we just kept publishing the comic book because it was selling really well, <laughs> right? <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, uh, fine. And Chris used her in the X Men. Chris liked the character. Oh yeah. And uh, uh, so anyway, you know, we we kept going along with it, and, and uh, uh, I wrote a few. I think uh, I think Archie Goodwin had a nice run on it. There was wonderful stories. Um, I think, though, that uh, it was not one of those things that uh, was going to have a long lifespan. I mean, right. it, 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 uh, if you had had the greatest creative team on there, yeah. But, but uh, Archie couldn't keep up with it. I certainly couldn't do it. And uh, we just couldn't get people on it who were interested enough in that type of character. Right. And uh, but you know, like who was the guy who did concrete? Maybe I think uh, he drew it for a while, it was brilliant. We had Sinkevich doing the covers, you know. I mean, I don't know why people don't respect that, but I there were there were some good books in there, right. Check out the ones Archie wrote. I mean, he, I, yeah, I've read that whole I've read the whole Dazzler series, I really liked it. I really like her involvement in the X Men, especially. Um, more so today, they're they're starting to use her more. They just announced they're setting a, a team around her, so I'm excited yeah. to see where that goes. Um, I really like this. I wrote, a, well. I wrote a graphic novel. I wrote Dazzler the movie, which was a graphic right. novel, which had nothing to do with the movie thing I'd written before, but uh, that went really well. People liked that. So right, I really like this question as well. How much uh, kind of flack did you receive um, for the amount of books that really came out, or was there not? as much because like you said earlier you were making money for the company 
when I wasn't making money for the company, it was making money for us, but that means making money for the company too. But uh, no, when I came, look, before I got there, when I was editor even, everything was late. We had books missing, shipping all over the place. We had unscheduled reprints. We had all this, you know, they, they, Len coined the phrase, the dreaded deadline doom. And there were way too many dreaded deadline dooms. And it was just, it was terrible. I mean, and I thought, boy, I got to fix this. So when I became editor in chief, I sat down at that desk the first day. I was determined that we were going to fix this. That month, January 1978, Marvel was supposed to publish 45 color comics. 26 made it out the door. Okay. You see how bad it was? Oh, yeah. It took That's me horrible. four months to get the correct number of books out there. And at the end of that year, I got a letter from the guy who ran World Color Press, the printer. And uh, uh, he said, congratulations um, for the first time in its history since 1939, Marvel Comics is on time. <laughs> <laughs> so was it difficult? Yes, because before I was there, it was anarchy. And people who are enjoying the anarchy do not like to be told, no, you must deliver this book or I'm going to get someone else to write it. Right. And people who are used to anarchy. I, before my time, Steve Englehart quit because he was always late. He was supposed to do three books a month and he was only really delivering two scripts. And so that meant that something just didn't show up. And, and so all the books were late because he's trying to do three and he's only doing two. So Jerry tried to talk him into, Steve, give one up, you know, pick one, give one up, catch up on the other two. And then, you know, if, you, if, if you're ahead on those, we'll give you another one. Steve quits because he, he was offended by that. All right, whatever. Uh, but, I mean, that's the kind of stuff you're dealing with is, is you know, people don't like their to be inter interfered right. with is what they would call it. And to me, it's like, no, we've got to be a professional company. We're a professional right. publishing company. We need to make our deadlines. And so, you know, I was not popular for that for a while. But you know what? It got the job because done. Because we made the deadlines, we're no longer paying penalties and fees at the printer and the separate. That saved hundreds of thousands of dollars, which I used to pay the artists. Because we were on time and people show up, the book was there. You know, if, you put, if the book people show up to buy the book and it's not there, it's really bad. It's a, it, it's a real downer. So, so we started getting it there on time and, uh, and all of a sudden sales are better. And, and, uh, and, and like I said, I got all these rate increases and in royalties and benefits, health insurance, life insurance, do three jobs a year. You get health insurance. So, so it was, it was really good. It was hard for a while for the first couple of years. I got a lot of grief. Uh, then when people started really doing better, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the company is booming and we we came back from the edge of death turned it around and took off and this was you know? probably and, by and was, 76 right at that point 78 well, I, I started as editor-in-chief in 1978 so this would be like 80 80 you know star wars by the way kept us alive oh Marvel yeah got us to do star wars in 1977 which nobody at marvel wanted to do i didn't have a vote i was just the editor but a lot of people resisted it and Roy just insisted, 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 and he got it done. Star Wars alone, the sales were so good that not only did they save the tail end of 1977, they kept Marvel alive. They gave me one year to turn it around because without that, we would have, we would have been losing millions. The people who owned at Cadence Industries, they didn't care. They felt no obligation to publish comics. Oh, look, they're losing a couple million bucks. Let's, let's get rid of them. You know, or, or or just go roll reprint or or, or you know, strip it to right. the bone. Right. So I, I like so he bought he bought me time to he bought us time because I had this incredible crew to turn it around and we turned it around and and uh, we went from Marvel and DC were both roughly thirty percent of the market when I started seventy eight within a year or so two years we were seventy percent of the market and DC had fallen from thirty to 18 percent however right. the direct market had started up marvel's doing better books that helps the stores more stores start happening everybody's growing and so the market grew so after that after we got to 70 percent, which was our peak 
DC was 18, but 18 was bigger than 30% used to be because the market had grown so much. They were still a little peeve about it, but I mean, everybody was doing really well. And uh, the whole business, because you know, the DC is not going to take it lying down that, that uh, Marvel's doing all this great Daredevil and X Men and all that. So they're doing Watchmen. They get Frank to go over there do Dark Knight. I mean, you know, they're fighting right. back. <laughs> they're fighting. They got George and, Perez. Yeah, and then so start trying to Titans. pay people better and stuff. And it was, yeah, you know, it was great. Titans. It was good for the whole industry. It's good for everyone. Right. Right. You know, um, and DC around the 80s really started to sell more books than just Batman a lot of times. Yes. <laughs> Which is yeah, good for DC. Stuff, the Titans came along. You you know, they were doing, they superheroes had... kick up and, and uh, get a whole new popularity of, of readers at that time. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, Bob Haney invented Titans you know, what, Way back then. before that. But, you know, they finally hit that combination. They got Marv, who, who was a good uh, Marvel type guy. And they had Perez, who was good, solid Marvel background. And they did it. Um, they had kind of their own little continuity going on. They weren't interfering with anybody else. Boom. It just took off. It was good. People loved it. They sold really well. So so anyway, there was a good time for comics. You, you know, it was a little hard getting there. But, right. but uh, we had good people, and we worked our tails off. We, right. To, to, you know, uh, 10, 12, 14 hour days, you know, all the time. But uh, right. but we got it done. Right. And look what the industry is today because of, of what you guys did. So uh, it's well, a win-win for everybody. The, you know what? It, it, is, it has occurred to me that a lot of the movies that have been done were based on stuff that the guys back in the 80s did. You know, I mean, the Claremont's X-Men and, and uh, a, a lot of the other uh, things, even Guardians, you know, I'll grant you it wasn't exactly like the comic, but it, you know that, that that was back in the late seventies, right. early eighties. Right. Uh, great question here. Was there a creative team series that you wanted to get off the ground but never really came to fruition? Was well, a series I like, like, or, or like a comic? No. Well, everything we, we want. I had a pretty. <laughs> good hand. We did everything we wanted. I I never and I didn't have to argue with anybody. I I mean I just we would decide and we would do it i'd write what they called a new project memo to inform everybody hey we're doing this new book called you know power pack or whatever and circulate it around nobody could overrule it nobody, nobody could, <laughs> could uh, turn it down except the president and he'd never opened a comic book in his life so he he's uh, he didn't care as long as, as, long as we were money. doing well you know right. he didn't care what i did as long as it sold so what was the inspiration behind the new universe the new universe was um, two years before Marvel's 25th anniversary year, uh, which was 1986. Right. Um, uh, the, the PR person, Pam Rutt, her initials are PR. She's a PR person. Anyway, uh, what a coincidence. All right. So, so she called a, a meeting and uh, it was the president and all the vice presidents. And I was a vice president to sit around a table and come up with ideas for Marvel's 25th anniversary. Some, you know, how are we going to, you know, acknowledge, celebrate this anniversary? And they're going around the table and, and these people who had never opened a comic book, I'm telling you, the Marvel executives, uh, they didn't, they had no clue. They didn't care. They, uh, they comic books, we won't read those. But uh, I mean, I had the uh, vice president of licensing called me up one time and said, Jim, I made the greatest deal for Wonder Woman. And I said, I said, Gail, we don't own Wonder Woman. What? <laughs> <laughs> the vice president of promotions calls me up and says, how many stories are in each book, Jim? I said, how many do you think, Nancy? And she said, oh, I don't know, four or five. I said, it's usually one and sometimes it's continued. Maybe you should open a comic book someday, you know, but this is what you're dealing with. These are vice presidents, right? They never opened a, a book. The president never opened a book. So, so anyway, they're coming up with brilliant ideas like, well, let's do a coffee table book. Oh, yeah, that'll shake up the world. So finally, they come to me, and I had plan A and plan B. And plan A was, I said, I said, you know, this universe has been running for 25 years. I said, and it has some issues. I said, for instance, Reed Richards was fighting with the French underground in World War II. You know, Nick Fury is 150, but they came up with this you know, forever serum that kept him alive. Uh, I said, uh, you know, um, the, the Iron Man's origin isn't the Vietnam War. 
um, lots of other stuff, you know, and also some pretty dumb stories. There was one dumb story where Hercules ties a chain to lower Manhattan, drags it out to sea. Well, that science says you're wrong. That doesn't work, you know. And then he drags Manhattan back with the same chain. So now, as far as I know, the battery's up by the Bronx. So anyway, I said, you know, we, we could, what we could do is we could announce in January that we're going to end the Marvel Universe. And I would and coordinate so all the books came to an ending in June. And the universe is done. Okay? And then July, we start with all number ones. Okay? And we keep everything that's good, and we just lose Manhattan being towed out to sea, that kind of stuff. And so, um, uh, uh, this uh, uh, was greeted with uh, tremendous fear and loathing uh, because the circulation guy says, We're 70% of the market. What's wrong with you? It ain't fixed. Don't fix it if, if it's, it, ain't, it ain't broken. It ain't broke. And, and I, I said, Well, you know, they are they're, they're just shattered down, you know, because we were so successful. You know, why would you change it? All right, fine, 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 fine. So then uh, uh, I said, all right, well, then it's to celebrate the creation of the universe. Why don't we create another one? Everybody liked that idea. So I walked out of that room with a huge development budget, like a quarter million dollars. And, and we were going to have guaranteed royalties and all this stuff. Because how are you going to get Walt Simonson to leave Thor where he's doing really well? And right. do something new that might not work out unless you can guarantee him he won't lose income. You know, I had a nice marketing budget. I had, we see we were doing so well that I had lots of money to play with for the new universe. But two weeks later, um, I, I get a call to come up to the president's office. And he says, that budget I gave you, he says, uh, how much did you spend so far? I said, oh, 10,000 bucks. I don't know. And, and uh, he says, don't spend another penny. He said, I don't want to spend any money on this thing. I said, well, what? You know, you mean you don't want us to do it? He said, oh, no, you just have to do it on staff. <sighs> so no development budget, no guaranteed anything, no marketing money, no nothing. The reason it turns out is that because the president, one of our vice presidents and uh, four members of the board of directors of the parent company had taken Cadence Industries, that was a parent company, had taken it off the stock market. And they had, for a, a couple of years, they'd been selling off all these crummy little companies like US Pen and Pencil, Perfect Subscription, blah, 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 all these huds, uh, the uh, vitamin quota shops, Saks Theaters, all this crappy little conglomerate. And they were getting rid of this stuff. And um, uh, and making money for themselves, um, and so uh, it had come to the point where the time to sell the crown jewel, Marvel. And as soon as you owners decide to sell a company, they don't want to invest anything anymore. They, as a matter of fact, they want to uninvest. They want to try to drop money to the bottom line, because companies like Marvel are sold for a multiple of their earnings. So. If you save a penny and put that on the bottom line, you might get 25 pennies back when you sell the company. Right. If, if anything, anyway, if you save a penny, make, make more money, whatever, you can increase your multiple, okay? And, uh, and it can make a lot more money. So so they just took it all away. They said, oh, no, you still have to do it, but it's on staff. Right. Uh, so if you look at the credits on the New, new Universe books, it's me, it's Archie Goodwin, and, and it's a bunch of assistant editors all the people who were able to and willing to help me for free. Okay. Uh, with, you know, which, you know, the, we, and the artists we could get was whoever couldn't get work that week. Cause we couldn't pay, you know, Walt Simonson's rate and guarantee his royalties. You know, we, we, uh, we were just doomed. Now Archie would help me so much. He was a champion. He, he just, uh, you know, he, he knew I was, was having a problem there. That was also when I was having uh, a lot of my arguments with Marvel because when the people are trying to sell the company, they're basically selling you down the river. Um, they cashed out our pension plan. They eviscerated our health care. They got rid of some of the programs that I had gotten for artists. They stopped paying foreign royalties. 
they, you know, they, some, they wouldn't pay a lot of things that they were supposed to pay. And the vice president of finance said, yeah, we're not going to pay that. Maybe if they show up with their lawyers. I said, great. I'm going to go downstairs and say, Walt, the reason you're not getting foreign royalties on Star Slammers is because the people upstairs are screwing you. So go get your lawyer and come back. He's not going to go get his lawyer. He's going to quit and go to D.C. Oh, and then it's Jim Shooter's driving talent away. <sighs> All right. So I couldn't win. Eventually, uh, it, it just got ugly, and, and the, the new universe was a disaster because, you, you know, you can't do it with no support. And, from the, uh, from the higher and we, ups. Yeah, and, and so so we ended up, uh, I mean, I and I, that was fighting up with the upstairs people every day. So as soon as they could, they got rid of me. And um, uh, I will say this, though. In the new universe, there were some good stuff. And Archie Goodwin came up with some brilliant ideas. And the assistant editors did pretty good. And me and Starbrand, uh, I, I got lucky. Uh, uh, John Romita Jr. came into my office. He said, he said, you have anybody drawing your book yet? And I said, no. And he said, I'll do it. I said, no, that's crazy. I said, this, this is going to have no support. It's going to go down. You're, you'd have to give up something that what you're making good money on to do this. Forget it. You know, right. he said, I want to do your book as a favor to me, just to help me. You know, I said, you're crazy, but OK. So he he became the artist on Starbrand. That same day, Al Williamson calls me. Say, I heard JR's drawing your book. I want to ink it. I see you guys are out of your minds. But OK, <laughs> you know, so well, start do it anyway, you know, <laughs> class art on Starbrand, you know, and, and uh, it wasn't because I pulled strings because they volunteered. Right. So this kind of this is pretty interesting. So it leads me to like a, another question is how did you balance creative freedom with um budgeting and sales well i first of all i'm i wrote the budget okay and i beat my projections every year so nobody hassled me i could do whatever i wanted that's why you you know if you saw us in cabbage cover on a book i didn't have to work that into the budget you know baloney i just did it because i had i had my my budget it wasn't book by book I was based on the average page cost and the number of pages we expected to produce and so forth. Always beat my projections, never got any grief. And uh, so we basically did what we wanted. Um, uh, and uh, everything was selling pretty well. And if it started getting down around under 150,000, then I'd start getting grief from the circulation people and the financial people. And they'd say, well, you know, why don't you cancel us, Turkey, and do something better, just like on Daredevil? And I could get away with fighting them for a while, but you don't want to be in a battle with the financial guy and the circulation guy, you know, you, 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 so, so basically, and they, like I said, they had the ear of the president too. So eventually they probably talk him into saying, Hey, shooter, you know, cancel this shit. And, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I reluctantly canceled a few things like master of Kung Fu, which was falling down a uh, dazzler had run its course. Uh, right. Most once, uh, once Engelhardt and Starlin left uh, Master Kung Fu to do more of their cosmic stuff, that book didn't really sell with Doug Mensch on it. Well, no, it did. Well, for a while, it did all right. For a while, it did all right. And Doug, that uh, some of the best stuff he ever wrote. Was right, right. Kung Fu. And it had Paul Galassi for a while. And that was great. And then it had Gene Day. And he was doing great. But by that time, the Kung Fu craze had been over about 10 years. And, and you know, it, it had fallen. And it, even though it was I thought we all we all liked it. Everybody right. in the office liked it, but but we could see that it had run its course. Right. And uh, I couldn't talk Doug into doing anything that I could win an argument with upstairs. You know, say like, you know, make oh, well, don't worry, we're going to do some exciting new thing with it. You know, nah, he didn't want to. So okay, we had to finally cancel it, and so I, I I canceled a few books here and there, not 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 all that many. We were doing pretty well. I mean, Dazzler was out selling Superman by forty thousand copies a month when I canceled it. Okay, so, uh, so you know we weren't like in trouble there. You know, right. it was so 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 you know, and, and like I said, the budget was pretty much mine, and I could do what I wanted, and, and I didn't have any issues there. Uh, I mean, I had a sense of hey you know you, you better not uh go crazy you know and have have you know some some book that's you can't publish a 10 million dollar comic right. right um 
so so anyway but, but we we were we'd fine and and uh sales took care of themselves uh pretty well uh we had some pretty good direct market sales people and they kept people informed out there uh, and we you know we published marvel age magazine which was good because a lot of people relied on that to see what was coming up right and kind of play catch up with characters they missed and all that yeah yeah and then and then we did a couple things that had not unexpected effects but 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 um surprisingly better than expected effects uh secret wars yes which sold gangbusters huge right the first other. first big event which um which is awesome when I, when I got to talk to John Beatty, who was here earlier. Shout out yeah. to him. It's and you said his name right, said. Beatty. Everybody gets it wrong. I know. He, he said, first thing he said, it's funny, because uh, when Bob Layton was on the show, he's like, before we get started, repeat after me, Mick uh, Liney. And I'm like, I, I've met the guy. <laughs> Beatty came on, he's like, repeat after me, Beatty. <laughs> uh, but John, John's awesome. And Secret Wars was first big event ever. Um across comics that was phenomenal what you guys were able to do um involving yeah, some of my I mean, favorite it, character moments between magneto and doom which it, i kind of geeked out about reading which i don't usually do <laughs> well i geeked out when i was writing i mean the thing is uh what it did was it was this big event and a lot of people read it and they said hey i didn't i didn't know this about iron man and and so like they they'd be introduced to characters they weren't quite as familiar with and the sales picked up on those other books because all of a sudden people say, hey, this Iron Man guy is pretty cool or Thor is right. pretty cool. So uh, so that had a good effect. And then after I did the first Secret Wars, um, the uh, uh, and the story there is that is that DC was had a toy deal with Kenner. They were doing superheroes. Mattel came to Marvel and said, yeah, okay, fine. We know you're out selling DC five to one in your market, but the worldwide people know who Superman is, Wonder Woman, Batman, Robin. You know, people sort of know who Spider Man and the Hulk are, but that's it. And you, you know, they 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 talk about Q scores. That's that's how many people per thousand know right. the character. Uh, at any rate, uh, we didn't have as good a Q card scores, and they said, well, if you do something to get publicity, a lot of publicity. You know, we'll do it. I said, how about one big story with all the major heroes and all the major villains, 12 issues. And the Wrecking Crew. <laughs> and the Wrecking <laughs> uh, Crew. You know, you need somebody to punch and fall down. Right. <laughs> Any, anyway, uh, um, so so we uh, they said, great. And other than that, they really didn't interfere with us. I mean, they never asked to see anything. We never sent yeah. them anything. And and uh, we uh, we were just trying to do a good comic book, and we did the best we could. Uh, it doesn't hurt to have Zach and Beatty tell you that. And Bob Layton doing the, the yeah. little fill-ins when, yeah. when Zach and uh, yeah, giving my, Zach a break, and um, so that went so well. Finished it. It went down to the wire. I mean, we we always made made the shipping date, but it, it, I had one crew stay up all night <laughs> finishing the coloring and the inking on the last issue, uh, so it would make its date. And um, there's two ways to do that. You can do it fast and sloppy, or you can stay up all night. When we stayed up all night, um, uh, the uh, um, so we got that book out, and I'm like, oh, I mean, I didn't need to be writing it. I was editor in chief. I didn't want to write it, but but I couldn't give it to Claremont because then Vernon Michelini and all those guys would be upset. I, if I gave it to Michelini, then Claremont would hate every word he wrote for the X Men and. You know, because these guys are so invested in their characters. And, and you, well, they're, they're mostly that. their characters at the time. Yeah, when... you want that. You want the guys to care passionately like that. But you right. also don't want them fist fighting in the hallway. And so so I said, well, I'll do it because I'm the editor in chief. I am in charge of all the characters. You know, I tell you, what's, you know, what the X-Men are like, Chris, although I never had to, you know. But uh, uh, anyway, so I was I thought, well, you know, and they all yelled at me anyway. So that's fine. So I did it. And I I tried to work with them as much as I could. I talked to Chris, like, what do you have in mind? How can I help? You know, like for instance, uh, at first we were, I was going to take Kitty Pride, and then he said, no, he had a storyline running with Kitty Pride, and he right. didn't want me to finish it because <laughs> I'd have to in, in, in Secret Wars. And I said, fine, we'll leave Kitty Pride behind. He said, you can do that? I said, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. And, and he said, uh, he, I said, I'll tell you what, and I also have Colossus have a little fling when he's on Battle World there. And, and 
and that played right into Chris's hands. Right. So it's great, you know. So I'm like trying, I'm trying not to be a bozo about it. I'm trying to like work with people, you know. John wasn't, Byrne wasn't interested. Well, and Byrne, said, there must be something Judah you want to do. Out, Claremont and Byrne were kind of. They weren't friends anymore. Yeah. Uh, but I, Byrne I didn't want nicely. to. Byrne didn't want to do it, and I said, John, there must be something you would like to do. Maybe we could get it done. And he, and he said, Well, I want to put the She Hulk in the FF someday. I said, fine, I'll leave the thing on Battle World. How's that? He said, really? Oh, all of a sudden he's into it, you know? <laughs> and uh, and so so uh, anyway, I mean, I did the first one. And, and by the time I got to the end, man, I was exhausted. I had a full-time day job. I had this 14-hour day day job. And then I go home and I'm trying to write it to in the morning. And uh, uh, so, so after the last issue goes out, the president of the company calls me up and he asked me to come to his office. And I did. And he, he said, it's a great job in Secret Wars. He didn't read it, but he could read the balance sheet. <laughs> he, he, he could read the sales figures. And so uh, uh, he's a great job, great job. He said, when, when's the sequel? I said, sequel, uh, maybe I'll, this is January. I said, maybe I'll start on it in June, you know? And he said, no, you start on it tonight. I said, what? He said, he said, I want, he said this is a big no more. I want the sequel now. I want the revenues in this year. I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> so anyway, back once more onto the breach. And so I, I started doing the Secret Wars 2, and I didn't want to do it the same way. I mean, Secret Wars 1 falls between the December books and the January books. I said, okay, did that. Let's have this one run contemporaneously, and it could branch into right. the books, the, the other books. So, uh, boy, man, did that drive sales. The, the tie-in issues to Secret Wars... The lower books would triple in sales. The medium books would double in sales. And X-Men would go up about 50%. In the middle of crisis, which actually the fir their first issue came out on the same day as my last issue of Secret Wars. The first issue of crisis came out the same day. So they could read the solicitations. We all read each other's solicitations. And um, they saw that I was doing this branching thing. So you'll notice in the middle of crisis, they start doing the they branching. They started doing the branching. And I thought, well, it must be a good Marvel idea Wolverine. if they like it. You know? <laughs> Yay. Marvel and it, did, it was yeah. a good idea. And so a lot of people like, you know, they they read the uh, first issue, I think, is Power Man or second issue is Power Man. And they say, hey, Power Man is pretty cool. And they go try it. And at that time, I think it was Mary Jo Duffy on Power Man. She's doing great stuff. Oh, yeah. You know, and and uh, so they said, hey. And so instead of the sales falling all the way back down, they'd go down a little and stay higher. So we're we were doing great. I mean, and it just uh, I don't know. Like I said, I had the best people on earth, and if you can't win with that team, fire the coach, Garrett. Garrett yeah. the coach, you know, uh, Mike Spose for the Miami Heat. You know, <laughs> should have got rid of him years ago. <laughs> the year you lost to the Mavericks. <laughs> yeah. Um. So we were kind of kind of talking about uh, when you worked closely with Stanley earlier in the show, and something uh, occurred what was like the biggest lesson you learned from stan at the time that stuck with you during your years of editor-in-chief biggest lesson uh, i don't know a million little ones I <laughs> no i was working with him on the strip right. and i was creating the stories they're my stories but i'd run them by him and he'd say hey how about this or how about that i mean the guy really was a genius i mean you know and, and he, he i just you you stand in the room with him for a few minutes you learn stuff the same with archie the same thing you you can't spend 10 you couldn't spend 10 minutes with archie without walking out smarter um so no it's like i can't think of one big thing except maybe you know what i, I think that the thing and i already knew it but it became very very clear is just care about the stuff because if you care about it then maybe everyone else care. will you know, 100%. so we, I, I, I wanted guys to pour their hearts into it. That's why, well, like I said, when you walk down the hall and there's two grown, full grown people arguing at the top of their lungs, who's stronger, Spider-Man or Colossus? Your first instinct is, oh, grow up. And then your second instinct is, no, stay that way. Care that much. My first instinct is Spider-Man. <laughs> <laughs> no, you know what I mean. They're so invested in their characters. They love them. Right. So That's great. And then, and then, and part of my job was to try to keep them from being too possessive. I, 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 for instance, when I came in, 
uh, the guy who wrote the Fantastic Four thought he owned Doctor Doom and all the other characters, you know, villains who that were, were like kind of slated within that branch of. Yeah, I, I, and I history. said, no, you don't own Doctor Doom. Marvel owns Doctor Doom, and if anybody else wants to use Doctor Doom, their editor should come and see your editor and work it out. The answer is yes. The answer is always yes. It could be yes, but can you wait a month or yes, right. but he's he's on the moon, you know, whatever, you know. Right. Um, and so we started having a lot more cross pollination. And then it was just about, you know, me playing referee a little bit and also uh, coordinating, making sure that Dr. Doom uh, isn't conquering Switzerland because he likes chocolate over here at the same time he's destroying Hershey PA because he hates chocolate, you know, <laughs> and so. You know, stuff like that. It's trying to keep I mean, maybe it's a different type of chocolate. You know, maybe you just had a thing against Reese's and whatnot. <laughs> Try, trying, trying to keep them all kind of moving, sort of vaguely in the wrong direction. And you know, it, it's it's creative. It's always going to be a little helter skelter, right. and you can't micromanage everybody. And I didn't have to, because you don't have to tell Louise much. I mean, you know, it's like, right. what are you going to tell Louise? She knows. You know, Larry Hum, if you told him, he'd get cranky with you. <laughs> He's like, I know, you know. <laughs> so you know you, you've got great people leave them alone you right know? just let them let them do their stuff if they have an yeah. issue just be the moderator yeah and, and um, you know but with guys like miller he's a force of nature you know i mean he, he, he I, a couple of times i objected to something he, he was they i always told the guys you're doing something big come and ask me and or tell me actually and so uh, they wanted to kill electra I'm like that no, what why you know it's a good right. character what you know and frank says let me tell you the story and he told me the story it's a great story i like well, we can't not do that you know okay and i said but dead is dead and they say yeah we get it it's him and o'neill and then three months later come back and my office say we want to bring electra back i said no you know dead is dead and and he says let me tell you the story and he tells me <laughs> the story where a hundred ninjas have to give up their lives to reanimate her. And you're not even sure if it's her in there anymore. And I said, right. Miller, you're a force of nature. Get the hell out of here. I don't get yeah, just do that it. was that was always <laughs> weird to me. Now, that was actually that was the first Daredevil story I read. That was what got me into the character. That's why he is my favorite. That was actually. Yeah, that was one of the first books that I probably dove into. Yeah, um, but it, it, wasn't it, it was, great? It was um, really it was actually 163 was the book that related to me the most when um, Ben Urich is unraveling the yeah. um, origin of Daredevil. Yes. That really spoke to me. That whole yeah. that whole arc that Frank Miller and Kosh Jansen did really like brought me out of a darker place. And I, I was kind of struggling at that time. Well, but, yeah, the, the guy's um, great. It's just you know, funny. I always relate to Daredevil. I'm colorblind. Daredevil's blind. I'm one step there. I used to teach karate at the time at night, and I worked at a law firm. I worked at the state's attorney's office. So I was yeah. like, you know what? I could be Daredevil. I'm just probably <laughs> I'm, I'm better. Yeah. You're on a bulk up a little, yeah. I, <laughs> I was thinking about growing a few <laughs> inches first and then bulking up a little. But, <laughs> no, but I mean, you know, that's the thing is I used to go out. I, I had all my little tricks that I would do to just – Keep you know, keep te taking the temperature. One of the things I would do is every week we would get what we called the bundle, right. which was the stack of comics from the printer, everything they printed that week, okay, and magazines, whatever. Um, and in those days, uh, the Marvel comp list was big. Um, we gave comics to the freelancers, all the office people, the upstairs people who threw them away. Um, you know, we we uh, everybody got their bundle. And so what I would do is when the bundles came, I kind of sneak out, sneak around and see because they'd open the bundle and see which one they put on top, you know, or which ones they put on top, you know. And then I knew those. That's a hit. <laughs> yeah, what it is. Yeah. Um, backstage before the show, we were talking about Jack Kirby and how when he came back to Marvel, you were you were already you weren't editor in chief yet, but when he started doing a Turtles and started dappling into that you played a bigger, a big um, impact in the story and helping him out. We can talk about that for a little bit. Well, yeah. I mean, uh, the, Jack gave me that picture that hangs on my wall there. That's perfect. Uh, I'm, I'm, I like the bottom, that on the bottom, it says to Jim, a good friend, which I was. Um, but anyway, so Jack would send in every week. He had a contract to do four titles a month, pencil and writing. And he would send in a book a week. And you take it out of the envelope. The whole room smells like cigar smoke. 
Okay. But I would go over his books and other people had not bothered with him because they, they said, oh, well, he's like kind of his own editor. He's, so. he's the King Jack Kirby. Yeah, I know. And they, they just, I think they were lazy. But anyway, I said, no, I'm going to, you know, do what I can with this. First thing I, so I, I go over it and then I call Jack. And the first thing I'd always ask him is, Jack, is it okay if I take out some of these exclamation points? You do that, young man. Because he'd always put 10 exclamation points. <laughs> you know, and he's like, you do that, young man. Okay. So, and then we go over it. And I'd have little suggestions here and there. Or maybe he forgot something. or Because he was getting older, you know. And uh, uh, and so, he, oh, yeah, you do that, young man. And so he, 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 he never, you know, anything I suggested, he always wanted, said, that's fine. And uh, uh, at the end of each call, he'd thank me for helping him. Wow. Helping the king, you know, but, but um, anyway, but uh, you, you know, his stuff was not selling that well. Um, and so books kept being canceled and then he'd have to create a new one. Eternals was one of the new ones he created. I liked it. I thought it was great. I mean, I, he was a machine gun of ideas. I mean, he, he had so many brilliant things just coming at you so fast. Um, but here's the trub, trouble. In those days, 76, or I'm sorry, seven, 77, wait, no, no. Eternals came right, out. I had it right the first time. I had the right the first time. 75 is when he started. And uh, 78 in summer is when his contract ended. So for the first six months, I wasn't there. But for two and a half years, I was editing his his books. And I was on the phone with him hours every week with this stuff. All right. So so uh, uh, the, the, the trouble was it was all newsstand. There weren't any direct shops. Directs didn't really start off until the 78, 79. And um, so uh, the newsstand was mostly younger readers and so they'd look at these kirby books and they looked old-fashioned you know because jack's style was kind of old-fashioned old -fashioned. and uh and and so they'd think well maybe it's a reprint or anyway it just didn't catch on with the readers who were going to the newsstands and so like i said you know well, captain america we kept alive but but you know the, the the reason there's a devil dinosaur and a machine man and a eternals and stuff like that is because some of the other books just you know they were selling at a time when regular Marvel comics were selling somewhere between 40 and 50 percent sell through because the newsstand, you send them a whole bunch of copies. They sell what they sell and then they throw the rest away and only pay you for what they allegedly sold. Sometimes they cheat. But uh, but so regular Marvel comics, maybe 45 percent sell through at the newsstand considered good. Jacks were like 10 percent, 8 percent. I mean, not good, you know, I mean, way below break even. And so uh, uh, I, I thought that was sad. I, I, but the direct market started pretty much right around the time I took office. And by six months into it, and seventh month and eighth month, because Kirby's books are still coming out, on the direct market, they were self-sufficient. He's selling 35, 40,000 copies. Because we, the older readers, we loved it. You know, it, it was just that it, didn't, that it wasn't a newsstand type thing. And it was a shame because, I mean, he, he was, man, that the stuff was great. And I, I, I'm i glad to see that some of it is being made a movie. I'm sure probably his estate thinks, you know, that's him being ripped off again. But, I, you know, I, I don't have any control over that. I did the best I could to get him what I could. And... uh Anyway, but I, I do love the Eternals. I, I, I'm going to look. I'm looking forward to seeing a movie. Um, and I did, you know, I, I loved uh, working with Jack. Uh, right. Everything he did, I learned. And I, I, it explained things to me. I'd ask him. Right. And you'll love seeing Andrew. I'm sorry. I'd ask him like, why did you pick that angle? And he explained because when he was talking comics, he was sharp as a tack. Right. You'll love seeing Angelina Jolie in the movie. I will tell you that much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> She that was sounds fantastic. Good. I loved. I yeah. loved the movie. Um, I think for anyone who's on the fence of seeing it, if you if there's like twenty some people in the chat now, if you're on the fence of seeing it. It's an experience, something different in the Marvel universe, and yeah, go see it. It's worth it. It's worth it, and it's leading into some of my personal favorite characters yeah. going forward. So, um, 
I, I really enjoy what was a kind of a series that you didn't expect to sell really well that ended up doing it. Uh, Rom. Rom. Yeah, that's Sunday. one I've never read. That's actually one of the few ones I've never really gotten into. And I see a lot of Rom fans around. They're like, Natoya, read them. like I never really got into it. That for some reason, the president of the company came across this ROM toy, calls me up to his office. He says, what do you think of this? And I, I said, I don't know. And he said, look, it makes noises and it make, the lights flash. I'm thinking, oh, that's a big deal. You know, and, and so, uh, but he, he had already decided he, we're doing this, right? So we flew up to Parker Brothers together. It was, it was owned by Parker Brothers originally. We flew up to Parker Brothers, made a deal. He had already decided, you know. So I'm, I'm doing wrong. And uh, I, I wrote a foundation story for just a bare bones. Bill Mantlo said he'd love to do it. I said, you think okay. you can do something with this? Okay. So he took my little bare bones foundation and then he fleshed it out. He, you know, developed the characters. Uh, the girlfriend's name is Brandy. That's a Bill name. It's not a gem name. There's nothing wrong with the name. It's just not something I would come up with. And, uh, you know, it's fine, you know, but but you can see his influence all over it. And guess what? The toy died right away. But the book went on for years and it was good. And we had Steve Ditko doing it for a while. Right. And it was great. Right. Um, what about like uh, titles such as like Iron Fist? I know that Iron Fist came in two years before you became editor in chief, but later got his first solo series in 78, I believe, tying into Claremont's X-Men. Yeah, uh, it, it, they, uh, I think <clears throat> they created it and uh, various people worked on it. Right. Uh, and when Chris was doing it, when I came in, it was what they call a twice quarterly. It came out eight times a year. And uh, it didn't, it was lower tier book, but it, it was okay. It did enough to stay alive. Uh, I think that... Uh, um, it was always sort of marginal. And then uh, was it Chris who did the uh, Power Man Iron Fist team up? Yeah, Chris brought him in there. Yeah, and, and that that perked it up something wonderful. And then uh, Mary Jo Duffy started writing it. And boy, you know, I mean, when she came in, she was an assistant editor, right. smart, smart lady and, 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 you know, talented, but she didn't know everything. And uh, the best thing that happened to her was um, when I convinced Archie Goodwin to come and do Epic, um, I was trying to make life as easy for him as I could. I said, Archie, you don't have to get somebody from the outside. I said, if you want to steal one of the assistant editors who's already here, I said, it'll be like a promotion for them. I think that's an honor. It's a, it's kind of important to be the assistant on the creator own stuff. And I said, you know, nobody's going to fight you on that. Right. And so, so I know one did. And I, I can't remember whose assistant Mary Jo was, but, but he chose Mary Jo and he could have had anybody. And he right. chose her. Okay. Like I said, you sit in the room with Archie for a while, you get smarter. And she sat in the room with him every day. Right. And I, she learned a lot. And um, in, in my opinion, I think Archie re was really key to her developing as a creator as a writer. Right. And so when she was later, she's doing star Wars and then she's doing, uh, um, uh, power man, Iris and other stuff. And, and boy, she was good. You right. Know, probably still is. Right. Who do you think was the most underrated or underappreciated creator at the time that you read in your chief? Roger Stern, Roger, Roger Stern, Stern. Spider-Man. <laughs> Brilliant. Dr. Brilliant. Strange. Creator. Solid. So good. And, and yet his name doesn't come up, you know, and you'll hear your other people's names mentioned. And I don't know why I think that right. it's like, I, I think one of the things he was doing the job so well, people cared about the story. They weren't looking for what is, you know, what is he doing this month? He, he, he made you care about the story and uh, he did a, he did brilliant work. Um, and he was, he started at Marvel about the same time I did. I was the associate editor. He was one of the assistants. Um, and uh, uh, so we we became you know we're the new kids so we became buddies and and um, he he learned super quick and he really got dangerous pretty quick. When I was doing the Avengers, I really couldn't do it. I, it was it was 
working all day and trying to write at night and I just couldn't keep up with it. Right. And so, but I didn't want to give it to just anybody. I mean, I, I, there've been a couple guys work on it. Matt Lowe, even Michelini. Michelini's great, but he, you know, I didn't like his Avengers. I was kind of holding out for Roger and sure enough, he, he became available and I said, take it. And he did it brilliantly because he, it's like everything he does. He, 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 he understands it. He gets right. it. He gets right. the concept. He understands the nature of the characters. And then he, he, he uh, creates with that. And, and he's, uh, he's just great. You know? Right. I, I don't think he gets nearly enough praise. He should right. get more rewards and stuff. Right. I, I always kind of felt the same thing about the Basima brothers, uh, Sal and John. They always Busema. just stopped. Busema. Sorry about that. Busema. Sorry. Busema. 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 Sal Busema and John Busema. Yes. Um, I always thought they were really underrated as well, just because they got the job done and it was very solid. You knew what you were getting out of them day in well, and day out. You know, John, if it was if he was born in the Renaissance time, he'd be rivals with Michelangelo. He, he was <laughs> an amazing artist. Just, yes. you know, just the, one of the best ever. I mean, and uh, and and he he uh, he did a great job. Um, Sal was was good too. I mean, I wasn't quite John, but he he was good too. Uh, Sal, John was more, um, I don't know, organic about it. I mean, he uh, he'd sit down and draw like things out of his head. People used to look at the back of the page when John's stories would come in. They turn it over and look at the backs of the page because he would warm up in the morning with the little drawing on the back of the page. And so he draw these incredible things like, you know, like a, a cowboy lying on his belly, drinking out of a water hole with this rickety old horse behind him. That's a warm up, you know, <laughs> you right. and, and uh, this beautiful stuff. And I think uh, Sal was uh, uh, he wasn't quite as um, I don't want to say I don't want to say creative. It wasn't uh, it wasn't as free about that stuff. I mean, he did uh, uh, a little more standard right, stuff right, right. and uh, and fine and did excellent stuff. But uh, uh, they were there. There was a little bit of a difference between. Um, I asked John Busema what who his favorite inker was. He said my brother. <laughs> <laughs> And Sal was. He was a tremendous anchor, but he never got to ink much because, you know, he was always uh, uh, doing breakdowns. Right, right, right. So earlier when we were talking about Frank Miller, it just occurred to me, when when him and Claremont went to do Wolverine, did you get a story with that too? Let me tell you a story. <laughs> yeah, well, so, well, you know, Chris has a great eye for artists. As soon as he, like, saw an up-and-coming artist, he wanted to glom on. And uh, and he was good at bird dogging him too. He he'd find them at conventions and stuff. Because Chris, unlike most writers, they got a good editor. You know, let's say that they're writing Iron Man or something, and uh, the penciler is going to leave to do something else. Well, they let the editor find a new penciler. You know, not Chris. No, if he knew that they there was going to be a, a new artist needed for well any series, but especially the X Men, he's he'd go hunting. You know, <laughs> he, he would try to find the guy. And so, I mean, one time I was at a Chicago convention and uh, Chris, I knew Chris was on the market for to find a, a new right, uh, artist. And uh, so this 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 guy shows me his samples. I'm like, hey, it's pretty good. You know, give me your information. We, we can use you. And um, as I'm walking away, I see Chris and I say, Chris, you got to go take a look at this guy's stuff. And so Chris goes running over and, and he looks, he comes running back. He says, can I use him on the X-Men? I said, yeah, Dan, or well, I think maybe it was Louise. I said, yeah, if your editor says, okay, that's okay with me. I think the guy's good. You know, Mark Silvestri. Mark Silvestri was the artist. And, uh, you know, so, so anyway, all right, here's Chris. And here's this, this new kid, Frank Miller. And he's just starting to get hot. You know, he's really taken off. So Chris, gloms onto him and the two of them come into my office and um i guess they'd already talked to the editor and the editor sent me i don't know but um chris says um we want to do a wolverine miniseries and i'm thinking hmm i got claremont it's great you know got miller he's rising star got wolverine he's popular you know and so i says yeah what's not to do okay 
so so uh, we did the Wolverine miniseries. And I got to tell you, see, people don't understand this. Wolverine was popular, but he wasn't a superstar. Right, right. That series made him a superstar. Right. The, and it was the always... work those guys did made Wolverine like uh, one of our most popular characters, at, le at least tied for most popular. Probably was and, uh, they, so they did a knockout job on that, you know. Anyway, right. It was always interesting to me because whenever I hear stories about how um, characters are supposed to be when Claremont and Cockrum started the X Men, it was supposed to be Nightcrawler, Colossus, as kind of like your your big two, especially like with Marvel team up being so popular. You the thing, Colossus, pretty yeah. similar. But when Byrne came on, Canadian guys just wanted Wolverine to kind of be the centerpiece of everything. No. No, he was already very popular. No, it wasn't Canadian influenced at all. No. Okay. It, you know, I was. Uh, I was misinformed. No, no. I like I said, it's Claremont and Byrne who kind of catapulted Wolverine to right. greater popularity, and everybody loved him, including John and John drew him better than than anyone except maybe maybe Cockrum. Um, and Herb Trimpe is underappreciated for the work yes. he did with Wolverine. Herb co-created it. And uh, uh, I thought he, his stuff was really on the money because, I mean, this little, tough, dangerous guy fighting the Hulk, you know, wow, that's going some, you know. But but, but I think that, you know, I think a lot of people read too much in between the lines and stuff. It, it, it wasn't anything to do with John being Canadian. Okay. And I was, I heard, I heard it somewhere else. Um yeah, so well, they can saying, say what they want. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess we all need to look out for where we get information. And make sure we're double checking everything. Um, yeah. and then let's talk, let's talk about Valiant. You know, uh, co uh, co creating a company. I didn't co create a you company. Created I created a you company. created it. Um, creating Valiant. Um, where was like the inspiration behind that after Marvel? Well, you know, I got fired by Marvel because I right. became such a nuisance when they were selling the company. And I was screaming at them all the time. And then they, you know, I mean, as soon as they could, they got rid of me. Um, uh, so I needed a gig, you know. And uh, I had a couple fill in gigs. I was a consultant for Disney for nearly a year, uh, kept me alive. I, uh, I did uh, uh, some other small work. I wrote an arena show. I, uh, you know, kept kept alive one way or another, but I, I mean, basically, I they had Marvel done a job on me, and they they had managed to blame everything in the world on me, and uh, you know, Kirby was my fault, Gerber was my fault, uh, everything was my fault, you know, um, and so my phone never rang. Nobody called me. You know, you think ex editor in chief of Marvel had written some stuff? Nah, nobody wanted me. Um, so I thought if I don't start a company, I'm going to starve it, and uh, so I uh, managed to raise money. Uh, I had two partners and we, we managed to, well, first we tried to buy Marvel, the three of us we called ourselves Marvel acquisition partners. We actually got chase North America as the lending partner and financial advisor and a company called Shankman capital to put up the equity. And we made an $81 million bid for Marvel when they were trying to, when new world pictures was auctioning it, we made an $81 million bid. Ronald O. Perlman bid 82 and a half. And he took it. He was an insider at the selling company. He was no way he was going to let us win. I mean, yeah. he, we weren't even allowed to bid back. You know, the process called ratcheting, you know. Yeah, he, they just took it. All right. So I needed a gig and I got um, I, it's hard raising money for a startup. Very difficult. So it helps if you have some property, some some equity, you know, and uh, I. Uh, I knew this man, Richard Bernstein, who owned Western Publishing. He had tried to buy Marvel at one point and um, brought in his auditors and his lawyers to research buying Marvel. It's called due diligence. And uh, he spent half a million dollars on due diligence. And he was so disgusted by the Marvel executives and how stupid they were and how opportunity was left lying all over the place. They didn't know the product. They didn't even know what business they were in. You know, they're just collecting their paychecks with a couple of exceptions. Alice Donnerfeld, there was one licensing guy named uh, Steve uh, Herman, a couple other really good ones. But but most of these guys, especially the higher ups, the owners, they, they were just 
I don't know, dumbest rocks. And uh, uh, so Bernstein was like unimpressed with these guys. The only thing going well at Marvel was my, my group, the publishing. We were doing great. And uh, uh, so he interviewed me personally three times. And the last time he said, this is great. He said, sometimes I think the only thing I'm buying here is you and a bunch of used furniture. No, he didn't mean me. He meant all the guys who are making all the money. Us, you know. Right. And um, but that was a nice thing to say. And I thought, well, maybe he'll remember me. So I went to him and I, I, I he was happy to see me. And I said, are you aware that you own a bunch of really good comic book characters? He said, I do. I said, yeah. He's why aren't we publishing them? <laughs> I said, well, I, I don't know that. Anyway, he, he realized that his people didn't want want to be in the comic book. His his other executives were not interested. So, so instead of trying to create something or fund something or whatever, he said, he's look, I'll license them to you. I said, I don't have any money right now. He said, I'll hold them for you. He held them for two years, two years. When he's getting big offers from Marvel, DC, Dark Horse, other people, right? He held them for me. Okay, so. Um, finally did raise money partially because i had the promise of those characters i was able to raise the money and as soon as i got the money i was able to seal the deal and so founded valiant um and uh used a couple of their characters well f first my evil partner um he was uh, a lawyer and he represented nintendo for media and entertainment and so he made a deal with himself to license nintendo i couldn't stop it because his girlfriend was the person who put up the money which i didn't know he was sleeping with the banker and so i'm doing nintendo comics if i quit then all the people who came to work for me work for the pariah janet jackson don perlin uh, uh jade Mady, all these people they're on the street you're the company will fold right so I thought, well, I'll stick with it. I'll try to make this work. And then if it works at all, I can raise money and then buy these turkeys out, right? It weren't likely to succeed. Guess who else he represented? World Wrestling Federation. So he makes a deal with himself. He gets big fat fees for this, so, you know, and I got to do comics. So uh, those didn't work. And then finally, I got to do my superheroes, which is what I set out to do in the first place. And that it took us about nine months to eat up about 17% of Marvel's market share. Okay, we were making two two and a half million dollars a month pre pre tax profit. That's great. Marvel made two and a half million dollars all year with one hundred and fifty six titles a month. We had eight. So, so anyway, we we were doing good. Uh, I don't know what Bob Layden told you, but but the but Bob came uh, in as an anchor. Uh, he had so he had done some personal stuff that displeased DC, some some bad behavior that they didn't like. And so he, for years, he had been banned there. Um, he had a contract at Marvel. When the contract came to the end, they said, we're not renewing it and we don't have any work for you. Because I don't know how he pissed them off, but somehow he did. So he came to me and no place else to go. And uh, I hired him as an anchor. And uh, uh, was... Did, did, did he contribute? Everybody contributed. Everybody. Janet Jackson, Don Perlin, everybody, you know. I said, I need a name for a girl. Lucy, call her Lucy. You know, because we had all in one big room. And, uh, you know, so, so we, uh, with, with plenty of help, you know, built Valiant. And uh, it was doing just great. Like I say, my partner who was sleeping with a banker married the banker. And then they tried to sell the company behind my back and things got ugly and, and I ended up out of there and they ended up paying a great deal of money to Bob, Bob Layden, Barry Windsor Smith and John Hartz because they thought, well, without Jim, we need a big name, Barry. Uh, Bob was good at running the lettering, pasting, paste up production people. Right. And uh, John Hartz, a genius marketer. And they thought maybe with them they could keep it, but uh, when I when they got rid of me, uh, their their number one bidder was Paramount, was going to bid two hundred fifty million dollars for Valiant. When I walked, when I was out of there, they Paramount dropped out. 
And so they scrambled around, they found a buyer, a claim entertainment, $65 million in stock, but then the stock fell and it vested over five years. So they didn't get anywhere near that. So, I mean, I think they shot themselves in the foot. They, they oh, yeah. should have worked I mean, somehow with me, and but they didn't. They were greedy. Yeah. And that kind of, that's really unfortunate that people kind of get that way, um, especially something that you created. But, you know. I yeah, well, I mean, I, I was the principal creator of pretty much everything there. I mean, uh, you, I, I can name the things that other people created. Don Perlin created Slagger. He was also involved in creating Rye. J.J. Jackson was involved with a lot of stuff. She's always chipping on ideas. Bob contributed some stuff. Um, yeah, even guys like uh, Jade Mady and even the knobs. Bob called these the kids that worked in the bullpen the knobs. P.S. We were the only guys. We were the only company ever to have a bullpen at that point. The Marvel bullpen was fictional. I had a bullpen. We all worked in the same room. Right. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, everybody contributed, and that was good. You know, and, and I was, you know, the guy who was running it and deciding, well, I'll use this and I'll use that and I'll make that work. And, you know, I was writing almost everything. And if I wasn't writing, I was rewriting it because I'd try guys and it didn't work out. And so I have to fix it. Uh, right. But, uh, you know, anyway, one way or another, we, we uh, made some great stuff. And uh, I mean, and we're working with artists out of the Kubert School. Right. And then, uh, and then uh, oh, like I said, well, we were lucky. Barry had the same problem. He had burned his bridges at both Marvel and DC. So we were the only game in town. So I had him at Don Perlin. Don had a nice job at Marvel. And then when I left there, he started hating the place. He said, it's become a <laughs> snake pit. And he kept having secret lunches with me because if he didn't have, if, if they knew he was having lunch with me, they'd fire him. Right. So uh, he kept saying, you got to get me out of here. And he says, I can't stand this place. I said, Don, what are you, 60 something? You know, you got benefits, you got retirement. You, you want to come and work for a fragile startup that may not make it? And he said, I don't care. He said, I want to come with you. Okay. So I got Don. He was a godsend. He was great. And then we got this miracle from God, David Lapham. Just, you know, guy sending in samples. We hired him. He turns out to be like, like the next Frank Miller. He's great. Right. Uh, and then we needed guys. We couldn't find anybody except we started finding guys no one else wanted stan drake no one wants stan drake what's wrong with you people you know <laughs> john dixon Jeremy cologne steve ditko ralph reese so we one way or another we had the over the hill gang and then we had the young kids who listened to the over the hill gang and you know we ended up doing some pretty good stuff right and uh, uh took like i say took a 17 percent chunk of marvel's market share and and that was in nine months that was nine months. Yeah, watch me go, pal. Right. Yeah, fire me and look what happens to your market. Well, you know, I mean, they. I think that the, the other people never had any faith in it. They thought, you know, it was a it was hula hoops. It was, you know, it was a fad. It's over. Let's cash out now. You know, I would have built them. I would have built them a, a billion dollar company easy. Right. We're at one hundred percent. Well, Jim, I do want to thank you for being here today. Um, taking up a lot of time. Uh, thank you so uh, much. That's all right. Uh, thanks for listening to me rant. Oh, your stories were incredible. This is probably one of my you favorite. You a million stories. of them. Oh, yeah. I, that was what I heard before. I was like, Jim has a lot of stories because you've been yeah. in the game forever, you know, and it's great having this learning experience for everyone. Um, big shout out to the chat for being here during your work day. Other stuff coming up. Our next guest is going to be Greg Hurwitz. Actually, this is going to be next Wednesday, just announced from cool. AWA Upshot. A great writer. I'm really excited to talk to him about Knighted Number One that just came out. And then we have Marv Wolfman on the 19th. And then we Marv's have, another one of those machine yeah. gun of ideas people. He's right, uh, amazingly talented guy. And then we have Jam Demateus on December 4th. Demattis. Demattis. Thank you. Thank you for How would you know? How would you know unless you heard him say it? <laughs> Exactly. And he always used to go by Mark, and now I think he's JM, and he might have even changed the pronunciation of his last name to, you know, uh, whatever it is now, whatever I just said, De Dematis. But uh, <laughs> great, <laughs> writer. great yeah. writer, that guy has a lot to say. He's, he's right. one of my writer. one of my favorite Spider Man writers. And Jim, thank you for per helping me pronounce names that I didn't know beforehand. <laughs> no, seriously, seriously, <laughs> how, would like... you know? how would you know unless you heard exactly. the guy say it? Exactly, it's important. You know? I try to make sure that I know everybody's name, even in my own chat. 
Well, it's hard to do yeah. because they, you know, like people still right. say Trump instead of Trumpy. You know, Trimpy, he, yeah. Yeah, he's not around to correct them now. Right. And I used to teach karate. So I always try to make sure I knew all the parents' names, all the students' names. When I was a manager of a, well, we probably had 400 students, new location, two years, probably 400 students, plus their yeah. parents. It, it was great. Um, well, if you ever need to know how to pronounce a guy's name, I'll I, shoot you I, if, he's, <laughs> if he's older than, you know, dirt, I know him. All right, I'll, I'll shoot you an email. <laughs> um, other than that, guys, we got chatting with the combo community up next at three o'clock on uh, Travis's channel. Then we go to Big Herm. Then we're back here tonight at eight o'clock. We're talking about You're why she's doing comic books. And then yeah, I, this is I do a lot of shows. I do a lot of shows. And then um, and then we close the show with uh, Manny tomorrow's cinema tonight. So thank you guys so much for your support. Have a great new comic book day. Thank everybody. you very thank much. You. It's it's been a lot of fun. I hope I wasn't didn't talk too much. Oh no, talk plenty. I loved it. Thank you so much, you guys. <laughs>